And we're going to turn into the word of the Lord here tonight. How many is thankful for the word of the Lord? Amen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, for those of you that have your Bibles, and for those of you who don't, we'll be having it up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 4. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, even before he made the world, talking about God, God loved us and chose us. Everybody say, chose us. In Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us. Everybody say, adopt us. Into his own family. By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. Everybody listen. This is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance. There it is again. He chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. And we've been doing that tonight. We've been praising and glorifying him. Amen. And just for a few moments here tonight, I'm going to speak to you on the topic, worth. Worth. Amen. Why don't you put your Bibles down and lift up your voices together with me and pray that God would just have his hand upon the rest of the service and that he would accomplish what he would want to accomplish. Lord, we are so thankful for your word, God. We are so thankful, Jesus, for everything that you have done already today. God, we just pray that you would allow your word to minister to us here tonight. God, in such a way that it would challenge us to be transformed. God, in your presence, we just pray right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. We pray right now, God, that you would have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And all, everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A man received a call from his wife who was on her way back from Europe. And in this call, she asked the question, how is my cat? To which the husband replied, dead. Leave it to a man to just break the news just like that, dead. And she got upset, and she said, couldn't you have been a bit more delicate with this, seeing it is my cat whom I'm attached to? Well, he said, what do you mean? So, of course, being typical, she had to explain it to him. <laughs> and uh, I got a couple of chuckles out of that. Uh, so she goes to explain, well, she said, you know, when I called you from London, you could have told me that the cat was on the roof. And when I called you from New York, you could have t told me that the cat was sick. And then when I arrived in the airport at home, you could have told me that the cat had to be taken to the vet. And then when I got home, you could have told me that the cat had died. He said, okay, I, I think I understand where you're going with this. And so she said, okay, great. Uh, by the way, how is mom? He thought for a minute and paused, and he said, um, she's on the roof. <laughs> we all go and search for truth. Every single one of us, every person across 
this wonderful planet that we call Earth. Go and search for something called truth. And truth that we can digest, truth that we can hold on to, truth that makes sense to us. But what we sometimes skip over more often than not is truth about ourselves. More often than not, we just skip over that part. We instead believe manufactured truth given to us by the world standards. We believe truth about ourself, manufactured truth, false, if you will. Without sometimes even realizing it, we estimate costs on everything in life. Everything that this world has to offer. Everything that you can see with the natural eye. We do this with everything. My kids the other day were asking for, some, uh, for a snack and I hauled out some processed ham out of the fridge and I, I did the normal thumb lick and I started counting them out. How much are we talking here? You know, like I was dealing out some $100 bills with the ham. You know, but we, we do. We do this with everything. We ask questions like, how much is this? And how much will it cost me? The Danish philosopher, his name is Soren Kiergaard, told a story of thieves who broke into a jewelry store but didn't steal anything. They did not steal. That's, that's not a very good thief. They didn't steal anything. They simply rearranged the price tags. So on the junk jewelry, they put the more expensive price tags, and then on the expensive jewelry, it was sold as junk. His point is obvious. We live in a world where someone has rearranged the price tags. As Mike Glenn once wrote, he said, nowhere in this switching of price tags more evident than in the area of self-esteem. In our culture, people are valued for how they look, how they dress, what they can do, or even what they have, but rarely, rarely for who they are. In our world, you have to be beautiful and entertaining, and if you are not, the world has no place for you. If you can't make the top 100 in the world on some list, you are nothing. This pressure on self-esteem has devastating consequences in the lives of our young adults. Young men commit heinous acts just to prove to someone that they are a man. Young women get involved in destructive relationships because they are told they are nothing if they do not follow the culture's standards. The advance of secularism and the onslaught of so-called sexual freedom have taken a horrific toll on how people feel about themselves. One writer, he described it as a tsunami that has knocked down and carried away most of the markers of our identity. Marriage and family, objective right and wrong. Respect for people and for human life. Life has been cheapened and devalued. It's no wonder lack of healthy self-worth has reached epidemic proportions. That's why determining our true worth is so critically Important. We get our clues from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, the first chapter. Paul begins writing to the church in Ephesus, and before saying anything about behavior and action, Paul spends the first three chapters reminding us, reminding them of their worth. There are at least five truths that Paul wants us to know out of this, and Pastor just spoke on Paul this morning. We all know where he comes from, and he is determined in his mind to write this letter to the church in Ephesus to remind them, remind them of their worth, lest they forget. In verse 4 of this context that we read, it says, For he chose us, for God chose us. Isn't that a profound statement? The choosing is God's effort, not ours. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We believe in Jesus Christ not so we can be chosen, but because we are already chosen. Paul continued, for he chose us in him. Did you hear that? He chose us in Christ, period. You are chosen by God. Even now you are discounting that statement in your own mind and saying, no, it can't be true. That's not for me. But listen, this is the word of God. It's not based upon where you live. It's not based upon who you are. It's not based upon what what sort of 
background you come from. He chose us. You didn't have to earn it. You didn't have to beat out others to get to it or build an acceptable resume in order to receive it. He chose you. In society, you may get picked last for everything, but not in God's kingdom. Perhaps that's why I appreciate that God makes a choice that he makes us. That he made it by his grace. And our worth is not a reason for God to accept us. It is the result of God accepting us. It is the result. Charles Spurgeon, he once put it, he said, I'm glad God chose me before I was born. He certainly wouldn't have chosen me after. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Think about it. We were, wrote Paul, chosen before the creation of the world. It's not that God created a world and then created people to dwell in it and then chose his favorites out of that. No, he chose us first and then created a world for us. What a thought. What a thought that God would create us first. God would create us, humanity, first and then create a world for us to dwell in. Someone has put it this way, before there was a place for the universe in God's hand, there was a place for me in God's heart. Furthermore, Paul said, he said in verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We are chosen to be holy. God is making us whole and holy by his love. A young man once studied violin under a world-renowned master. The time arrived for the student's first recital, and following each selection, despite the cheers of the crowd, the performer seemed dissatisfied. Even after the last number, with the shouts louder and louder, more louder than before, the talented musician, he stood watching an old man in the balcony. Finally, the elderly man smiled and nodded in approval. Immediately, the young man relaxed and beamed with happiness. You see, the old man in the balcony was his teacher. The applause of the crowd meant nothing until he had first won the approval of his master. The applause or lack of applause from the crowd around us means nothing. What we can attain from this world and what we can, the accolades that we can receive, the, the credentials that we can gain means nothing in the sight of that we have the approval of the master. You are chosen by God and you are holy in his sight. Second, Paul assures you that a position has been secured for you. In love, he says in verse 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption. We're adopted. Each and every one of us. Paul wrote his words in the context of a Roman world in which the wealthy adopted only those children who were well-suited for the inheritance of the particular family. But he points to God who knew us as rebellious sinners, who knew everything that there was to know about us, who knew where we came from, who knew our backstory, who knew everything, and still, still chose to adopt us. There is nothing we can say or do which will surprise God. Aren't you thankful for that? We don't catch God off guard. There's no skeletons in our closet that can frighten away God. Under God's eyes, we have nothing that could cause him to ignore us. We are totally covered by his love. It is, says Paul, God's great pleasure to do so. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Tim Keller, he points out that some people are put off by Paul's language of adoption because it's gender insensitive, he says. They argue, wouldn't it be better to say that we become sons and daughters of God? Perhaps. But that misses the whole point. Some time ago, a woman helped him understand this. He said she was raised in a woman, uh, in a non-Western family from a very traditional culture. There was only one son of the family, and it was understood in her culture that he would receive most of the family's provisions and honor. In essence, they said, he's a son, you're just a girl. That's just the way it was for her. One day, though, one day she was studying a passage on adoption in Paul's writings, this passage. She suddenly realized that the apostle was making a revolutionary claim. Paul lived in a traditional culture just like she did. He was living in a place where daughters were second-class citizens. 
when Paul said, out of his own traditional culture, we are all sons in Christ, he was saying that there are no second-class citizens in God's family. When you give your life to Christ and become a Christian, you receive all the benefits a son enjoys in a traditional culture. Our adoption means that we are loved and embraced, every one of us, no one left out. He is a father to the fatherless. He is a love to those who have never experienced true love. He is hope to the hopeless. Your circumstances cannot hinder or threaten that promise. In fact, your bad circumstances will only help you understand and even claim the beauty of that promise. The more you live out who you are in Christ, the more you become like him in actuality. You see, Paul is not promising you better life circumstances. He is promising you a far better life. He's promising that if you put your life in Christ, you will receive a life of greatness. He is promising you a life of joy. He is promising you a life of humility. He is promising you a life of nobility. The message, it puts it this way. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving. Embrace your position. Claim your status. You're a true child, a full son of God, a brother, sister of Jesus. You're a full heir. Paul, he then goes on to give us a third clue to our worth. A price has been paid for you. A price. A price that we could not pay ourselves. A price that you and I cannot afford. We look back over the course of time. And the price that has been placed upon us because of the sin that at times has crept into our life. You and I can look at that price tag and say there's no way. There is no way that I can afford to get myself out of this mess. There's no way that I can ever accumulate enough of anything in order to get myself out of this. But he says in verse 7, in Christ we have redemption. To redeem means to buy back, to buy something captive, to free it. It often meant the setting free of a thing or person that had come to belong to another and was powerless to free itself. That's you and I, powerless to free ourselves. For example, in the Roman world, after a battle, the victors would round up all the defeated enemy soldiers and make slaves of them. They would only be freed if someone paid a set price for them and would redeem them. Otherwise, they would remain a slave, powerless to be free. Paul wrote in chapter 2, we had been taken captive from God and placed in the concentration camp of Satan. We are powerless to save ourselves. So Jesus paid the price to buy us back for God. You are adopted because God has redeemed you. Did you hear that? I said, we are adopted because God has redeemed us. And the price paid for your redemption was a heavy one. In Christ. He says, we have redemption through his blood. It cost Jesus his life. You are saved through Jesus' blood. Jesus died for you. 1 Peter chapter 18, uh, 1 Peter, sorry, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, it says, God paid a ransom to save you from the impossible road to heaven, which your fathers tried to take, and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver, as you very well know, but he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless spotless lamb of God. You belong to God. And it gets better, according to Paul. Clue number four is that a pardon has been granted you. It says, in Christ we have a redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. You are forgiven. You need not worry about your shortcomings. You need not fear about being cut off from God's love. You need not try to cover your guilt. You are forgiven. Jesus' death paid for all your sins, not just for those already committed, but those yet to be committed. 
As William Hogan said, as Christ hung on the cross, he looked down the corridor of time and saw every sin you and I would ever commit, and he accepted the sacrifice of himself as payment in full for all of them. You belong to God. You belong to God. You are secure in Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. Jesus took your hell so you could share his heaven. Just think about that for a moment. Jesus took the hell that we live in just so that we could share his heaven. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were disfigured in our sins, Christ chose to take on that sin for us and adopt us. Paul's fifth and final clue is that a promise has been delivered to you. As in verse 13 and 14, he goes on to say, when you believed, you were marked in him. Marked in him. I don't know why I like that word so much. Marked in him with a seal. I was just telling Mark Barrett when we gathered together to pray with the team, I quoted him some scripture as he walked through the door. Psalm 37, 37, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. It's a good scripture. We were marked with him, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing, he says, our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to praise of his glory. We're sealed. The imagery out of this text comes from life in Ephesus. Paper documents were sealed with melted wax into which the owners pressed their rings with the image of their family crest. When the wax dried, it made a seal. For livestock, they branded the image with hot iron. Slaves were often tattooed with the family seal of the estate they were serving. The seal was a mark of ownership. So said Paul, God has sealed you with his Holy Spirit to remind and assure you that you are his. The mark of the family crest, God's family crest, is upon you by his Holy Spirit. He has marked you. He has sealed you with his spirit. Isn't that really all the reminder that we need? then nothing can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We end where we started. Your worth is not in anything you would do or say. Your worth comes from God, who has pledged himself to you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Come on now. If God is for you, who can be against you? What others think about you really isn't that important. You're not here to please others, to meet the world's standards. You're part of a grander plan. God wants to receive glory through you. It's not your availability he's, con your ability he's concerned about. It's your availability. He thought you were worth saving. He thought you were worth saving. I'm going to have the music come back at this time. We could all stand. In the Gospel of Luke, we, we read about Jesus teaching on the shore of a lake. The crowds are getting a little too close, so Jesus retains the services of a couple of fishing boats owned by local fishermen who were cleaning their nets. They had come in from a long night of fishing, hadn't caught a single thing. You can imagine what their attitude was like. I've been there. And when Jesus finished teaching, I guess he felt the need to reward his new friends for their generosity in lending their boat. So Jesus told them to let down their nets into the water. Jesus, we've been fishing all night. I <laughs> haven't caught a single thing. But Simon said they had been fishing all night and not caught a single thing. And yet, since he said so, they would try again. Kind of makes you wonder what Jesus had been teaching that would convince experienced fishermen to go out when they know there are no fish. But there are fish. There are so many fish, their nets begin to pull apart, so they call another boat for help. 
Simon, amazed by what is happening, asked Jesus to leave. He says, go away away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. This is the words of Simon Peter. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. They are just so amazed at what Jesus had done. They immediately know they are in the presence of someone incredibly special. And they confess their sinfulness to him. Jesus, he looks at the three men, Simon, Andrew, and James, and tells them to not be afraid. From now on, they will be catchers of people because of their belief in what they heard and saw that afternoon. When they brought their boats ashore, they left everything behind and followed Jesus. These men, just moments ago, confessed to Jesus that they were unworthy of being in his presence. And now, they hear his gentle call to follow him and be part of his ministry. Just moments ago, they stood and faced Jesus and said, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. And yet Jesus calls them out. When you know what you are worth, things change. Life changes. In praying about this sermon, you can begin to play. In playing, in praying for this sermon, I... I felt a message for this church... And I determined in my mind that I would end with it. The word that came to me in prayer was doubt. Someone, maybe multiple people in this place have woken up every morning with doubt. Maybe not doubt about God, but doubt in yourself. Doubt that you can do what God has called you to do. Doubt that you can accomplish His purpose for your life. Doubt that you will even make it. But I'm here to tell you tonight that He chose you. He adopted you. He redeemed you. He forgave you. He sealed you with His Spirit. Understand that your value is designated by God and no one else talking about worth tonight David realized this as he wrote Psalm 139 he says in verse 13 for you formed my inward parts you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works my soul knows it very well Isaiah the prophet he realized this as he wrote the words that God had commanded him to write down In chapter 41, verse 10, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. Worth. I feel that it is God's will to remove the doubt in your mind here tonight. There are enough voices in this world telling you that you are not worth anything there are enough voices in this world that would tear you down and tell you that you can't do it that you can't make it that you can't become anything but God wants to remove that doubt here tonight I know the Bible tells us to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think but I fear that some of us have gone in the complete opposite direction and thought too little of ourselves I'm going to open up this altar here tonight. God is here tonight to mend the brokenhearted. To set free those that are captive. To open the eyes of those that are blind. To make you see exactly your purpose in Him. That He has purposed you for something great. He's a great plan for your life. Amen. As they begin to sing right now, why don't we all come to this altar? Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. It's all in you, Lord. It's all.